Penny Brocky, tonight on Insight, why are more older women becoming homeless? I was paying 70% of my income on rent. So. There's nowhere livable that I can afford on the pension. The family said, we want you out within two weeks. We're going to sell the house. There's no plans anymore. I can't plan for anything anymore. Be careful. It, it can happen just like that. OK, would you like to have a look in my new home? Come on in. This is where I'll be living. This is my bedroom. My pillows, I've got blankets. I've got spare blankets down there if it gets really cold. Because I'm tall, I actually make a bed across and I sleep that way. I can sit and work on my computer. <laughs> OK, well, this is the command centre. This is where I will be sitting in the driver's seat, obviously. GPS, camera. I would like to have a home of my own. Uh, gardening's the thing. I love gardening and it's not really possible to do with this. However, I'm not the only one that feels that this is the only option for housing. This is my wardrobe. Well, there's my leather jacket. That might keep me warm. And in here is my shower and toilet, but I think that's all you need to know. We're not going there today. <laughs> I've done a, a few crazy, adventurous things in my life, so um, I don't intend to stop doing those sort of things now. No, I never thought I would be in this position. In fact, uh, you, you really don't know what your future holds. And suddenly there's a curveball and you go in another direction. Yeah. Di, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your, uh, your camper van with us. Um, you're 73. When did you start living in a camper van? Um, I actually bought it, I think, about March, but um, I was renting a property um, and I waited till the lease was up and then moved into the van. But I didn't stay there very long. I was offered a, house, a couple of house sits straight, you know, straight away. But... Mm. Are you living in the van now? Yes, absolutely. Why? Why have you reached the point where you have to live in a van? Well, I was paying 70% of my income on rent. Sorry. You OK? I'm OK. Um, I, I just... I was going backwards. Um, couldn't see that there was a future, so I thought, I'll live in a van. Why are you in that situation? I left my husband in 2010. Um, long story, but it was brewing for quite a while. Um, I got no money out of it. I think after 43 me years of marriage, I got about $8,000. $8,000? Mm. Why so little? Uh, I don't know what happened to it. So I set off house-sitting, which I did for two years, and went back to university and did a master's while I couldn't work. I couldn't work. It was difficult to get work. What sort of work were you looking for? Um, I was an English teacher. Um, English is a second language. And you couldn't get... Uh, uh, House-sitting, you're moving around. It's not quite so easy to... So you're not do. in a so, stable and place. At my age. So what do you live off at the moment? What, what are you relying well, on for money? Um, I do have some uh, small savings, but um, the pension. Do you feel like you have other choices or not? No. Why do you feel like you don't have other choices? Uh, I didn't qualify for public housing. Um, I had just a bit too much money, but not enough to buy a house. And of all the agencies, you know, they'll give me a psychologist and support and everything, but no housing. 
it's very hard to get in. There's an eight year waiting list anyway. Mm. How do you feel about your situation at the moment? Oh, I'm, I'm hopeful life will change. Maybe my novel, if I finish it, will be a bestseller. Working on that. <laughs> <laughs> and will you be on the move or are you going to try and stay in one place? Well, no, no, basically I'll stay in Brisbane, but I like visiting different places. So, and I discovered free camps too. You don't have to pay to stay. So there are many free camps around Australia and you just pull up and enjoy the scenery, stay the night and move on. Christine, you're 66. Where do you live? I'm currently living in a beautiful beach house in, on um, uh, the waterfront, house sitting. Hmm. And how long will that last for? Uh, till this weekend. What happens after that? Um, I have another house sit teed up for further down the coast. So is that what you do? You just move from one house sit to That's another? That's what I've been doing for a few years. Um, and why are you doing that rather than trying to rent somewhere or get some There's other. nowhere livable that I can afford on the pension. So you can just maybe find a place somewhere between $200 and $250 rent, but it will be crawling with pests and riddled with damp and um, with undesirable neighbours. And at this stage, I'm refusing to admit that I have no choices left. Why are you refusing to admit that? Because I would die very quickly in those conditions. If you're not very well, which I'm not, um, you can't sit and look at four walls, particularly if they're damp. Um, and so maybe young people can live in those conditions long term, but an older person can't. I did have myself on the Victorian housing list. I've got myself on the New South Wales housing list. And I have been told that until I'm actually in physical danger, until I'm actually sleeping in a park, they cannot prioritise me for housing. And it's about a 10 year waiting list. How did you get to the point where you need to house sit to have a roof over your head? I was never able to accumulate money because I lived my life managing fibromyalgia. And so although I was employed in fairly well paid work, I could only ever work part-time. I contracted so that I didn't have to take long contracts, I didn't have to work for long periods of time. And, and what work were you doing? What sort of I work? I was a technical writer and an instructional designer. So I wrote either training materials or computer support materials for people. How did the fibromyalgia affect you in terms of your capacity to work? It didn't affect my capacity to do the job I was doing. Um, I was always good at that. It affected my capacity to relate to my co-workers and bosses. Um, because when you're walking around in permanent pain, uh, maybe you're a little bit less tolerant um, of other people than would be desirable in a corporate environment. Mm. Um, That's putting it politely. So how did this snowball, this situation where you got to a point where you could no longer afford rent or you couldn't afford to have your own place? It, it, it crept up on me because I kept thinking I was going to be able to work my way through it. I don't think I confronted just how serious this situation was. I, I think it's only very recently that the, the housing at the bottom of the market has become out of reach. And so back 10 years ago, I could afford the bottom of the market rental, but I can no longer afford the bottom of the market rental. The housing prices have inflated so dramatically that they've left even low income earners behind, let alone pensioners. Have you ever owned property in no. your life? No. Di, when did money start becoming a problem for you? Oh, well, probably on, on and off in a way. Um, throughout our lives. We didn't save. We regularly visited our family, which cost us a lot of money. My parents were in Adelaide. Um, my husband's parents were in Melbourne. Um, we, we just didn't save very much. For so you were time. spenders? We were, we were spenders. Um, we put our children through private schools. 
Did you have housing plans in your own mind we when you our, separated? We've had, a, we, we've had a house twice. We'd been in business and didn't work, so we sold and a few years later bought again. Um, we, we've, we should have had more money. I, I, I don't know exactly what happened to it all. That's all I'm saying. Did you have housing plans when you separated from your husband? Did you think about what you were going to do I and knew, where you were I going to live? I knew then, when I left, that I would have nothing. Um, I, I just was extremely distressed and I couldn't... I, I was also suicidal at that point because I saw no future for me. I just wanted to run away and start all over again. And do you think of yourself as homeless now? Yes, but I, I do laugh about it in a sense. Um, I, just the way I, I deal with it. Um, I would like to have, um, you know, a, a permanent house. Um, and so from that point of view, I am homeless. But I do have a roof over my head, even though it's at a small one and not much room to move. Uh, but... Yeah, I know people are in worse situations than I am. Christine, do you see yourself as homeless? Yes. What's that like? Um, oh, frightening. Um, I, I'm the kind of person that's always got big schemes and big plans and big ideas. And I think I do that for my own sanity. I think if I ran out of the will to design something new, then there is actually no future. So I've got to live in a fantasy world to a certain extent. What effect has this lifestyle having on you, do you think? Physically, I'm wearing down. Um, it's getting to the point where I'm not going to be able to keep loading the car and unloading the car. Um, emotionally, I'm worn out. What about friends, family? I oh, mean, how far around are you moving? You can't sustain relationships. Look, I already had trouble sustaining relationships because of the fibromyalgia. When you're in pain all the time, a, a certain amount of moodiness is going to creep in. Of, sorry, I can't address that now. Leave it. So you, you, you get to that point. But also, when you're geographically mobile, I started being mobile in 2000, which was the first time I experienced unemployment. So I started going to wherever the contracts were. So I'd go to Brisbane or the Gold Coast or Canberra or Sydney. So over that period of time, you, you stop investing in relationships and people stop investing in their relationships with you. Doris, you're 64. Where are you living at the moment? I used to um, live with Mum uh, for 14 years. Um, I was her carer for six to seven years. And she ended up having dementia, Alzheimer's. And she passed away in um, February this year, yes. So once the house was sold, I moved in with my daughter. So the house was sold yes. and what's happening to the proceeds of the sale? There is nine brothers, there's bro nine brothers and sisters. There's nine of us mm -hmm. in the family. Did you have any plans for what you would do when your mother died? No, I had no plans because um, I didn't expect her to end up in a nursing home. This is, sounds ridiculous, but you never expect your mother to end up in a nursing home. So once you're in a nursing home, as far as they're concerned, they take away the carer's um, money and they put you on new start. So I had asked for um, these housing commission places and they had sent me to a couple of them. If you're getting 550 a fortnight and, and these places are ranging from 80 to 190 a week, you don't really have much left as far as mm -hmm. running a car electricity or gas and having two grandkids there would be no sharing of anything so you're left with really nothing you know mm. so tell me about your working life 
What, what, I worked what? all my life. Um, I'm a hairdresser. I um, ended up having a business called Close Shave. I ran that place for 16 years and I turned it also into a tattooing place. And what happened to the business? I had two floods and a fire in six weeks. You weren't able to operate the I, business? I couldn't operate. Okay. No. And, and so you went under financially with I the business? I certainly did. Yes, I did. Mm. I, I lost the business. It took me uh, probably the best eight months of that year fighting in, in the little bit of um, insurance money that I got. So. I lost and you everything. were married? You were married? Um, I was married for 25 years. Um, I've been separated the last 15 years. So I have two children. And were you financially secure during that marriage or yes, not? Yes. After the separation, I bought him out. So I kept the house and I actually rented it and went to live with mum in her house. And, uh, and I bought another property at the same time, so I had two mortgages going. This yeah. was when your business was yes. working? Yes, when it was working, yeah. And but just, when it went bad? I lost everything out of the business because I fought those eight months with, uh, with a commercial lawyer and she was worth $800 an hour. So over those months, I just lost everything that I got. Trying to her. fight yes, to, get that's right, to get it back. Now, at 64, you can't access the pension yet. No. So you're on the Job Seekers Benefit yes. New Start. Yes. What is that like for you, being in that situation? It makes you feel... You know, I've never been on the dole in my life. I never, ever thought that I would have ended up in that position. So um, it's, it's degrading. How do you manage on that? I live with my son for a couple of days and I live with my daughter. And, and are you going to keep that up, do you think? Um, you know, there's no plans anymore. I can't plan for anything anymore. I used to plan before six months to a year in advance, but I can't even do that with, from week to week. Have you tried to get work at all? In my game, um, being a hairdresser or being a barber, I think... Uh, it takes that little bit of, I don't know, it's, it's a bit of youth and I don't have that. And I think when, when you're behind a chair and you're doing someone's hair, you have to be glamorous, especially, especially in men's. You know, it was very particular for me to be a men's hairdresser and I think age has really done me in. So you you've know. lost confidence as I well? Have. Definitely, definitely. Mm. Let's have a closer look at the housing situation for older women. The number of older women accessing support for homelessness is increasing at a faster rate than older men. Up until the age of 65 and a half, a single woman is eligible for the job seeking benefit New Start, receiving $535.60 per fortnight. If she has a permanent medical condition, a woman can access the disability support pension, receiving $888.30 per fortnight. At 65 and a half years old, she can receive the age pension, also receiving a total of $888.30 per fortnight, though the age of eligibility is increasing. A snapshot of rental prices across the country shows that in Australia's most expensive rental city, Sydney, a one-bedroom unit costs $840 a fortnight on average to rent. That's around $300 more than the new start allowance, or $50 less than the age pension. In Australia's cheapest rental city, Hobart, fortnightly rent for a one-bedroom unit averages $360 leaving $175 to spare from New Start or $530 from the age pension. Single people can access a maximum of $132.20 a fortnight in government rent assistance. By the age of retirement, the average woman has a superannuation balance of around $80,000, just over half the average balance for men. Of the women who have savings outside of super, more than a quarter 
have less than $10,000. Last year, there were 195,000 applicants on social housing wait lists nationally. Christine, you were on New Start, now you're on the age pension. What can you afford? I try to top out at 200, including utilities. You've got to factor in utilities. And for me, keeping my car on the road, uh, to me, is another fixed expense, and it's the most important expense. Why? Because in the last resort, it's your home. So if you have nowhere else to sleep, you can sleep in your car and lock your doors. Um, so the car is the highest priority, then rent and then utilities. Um, I try not to go above 200 for rent and utilities. Mm. And how possible is that? Not very. Mm. By, by doing the house sitting or the, this sort of semi house sitting I do, where I'm not looking after dogs but I just pay for a room, um, I can normally pay somewhere between 160 and 200 for the room mm. um, in the house. That, that's the going rate for a room in the area I'm living in. And where are you looking? Around the south coast of New South Wales? Yeah, mm. yeah. And uh, it's, it's not the cheapest area, but it's not the most expensive either. So for the three of you, what is it like not having your own home at the moment? For me, I think the most significant thing is the powerlessness. Um, I am living in a beautiful home at the moment, looking after two gorgeous little dogs. It's not mine. So you have no power over your own life. And Di, what about you? What's it like for you not having...? Oh, well, it, it's, it, it is devastating. I have to be positive and, and <coughs> dream that some, someday I might get out of it. I, I, I don't know. Doris, yeah. what about you? What, what, what's um, it like for know, you not having...? To know how hard I worked for mortgages, yeah, mm. all those years. And to have nothing and at the end of nothing. it. Mm. It's devastation. Mm. I think the hardest part that I look at it today, here we are, us women, but it's our future, our children, our grandchildren. If we were in this stage now, I mean, I'm not a very good example to my kids at the moment because um, that's how I feel. That's how I feel that uh, I've let them down. You know, if, if, if hard work does this to you in the end, what are you doing here? I was a workaholic. All I did was work to provide. Um, and I think to myself, you know, please don't work hard because you might end up like me. I've come from a corporate background, earning six figures, travelling the world for business. That was my world. How did it affect you living in your car? Eventually I broke down. I just could not see any way out. Twenty years ago, the world was stunned by the sudden death of the most famous woman on earth. To mark the 20th anniversary of the death of Princess Diana, SBS presents a week of programs that explore the history, impact and future of the world's most famous family. There are major questions over what really happened. Making History Royals Week starts Sunday 7.30 on SBS and On Demand. Being a kid is about dreaming big, which is why MTA finds and creates world-leading teaching resources to help unlock the potential of little dreamers everywhere. My dad has a saying, a lie begins in the soul and then travels the world. I got 96 also. Point four. There's this girl at the mosque. Diane, she's really nice. You know the rumors we hear about girls born here. I was born here. Ah, your sister. You can't be seen together or speak to her. What do you want to do? I just want to make you proud, Dad. Last year, 384 people died on our roads. What would be a more acceptable number? Acceptable? 70, maybe? Actually, this is what 70 people looks like. It's a family. So, now, what do you think would be a more acceptable number? 
Zero. Zero. At best and less, our kids' soft organic cotton teas are guaranteed to last, guaranteed not to lose their colour, and guaranteed to keep their shape. Now for the new everyday low price of just $3. That's why we're this. Here's Patrick. He's looking up this property's potential price with a free ANZ property profile report. And here's Angus. We don't know what Angus is looking for. Know what to know. Search ANZ Buy Ready. It's time to dish the dull dinners. Tonight, we stand and stuff. Make it easy. Make it fancy. Make it famous. But whatever you do, make it yours. Old El Paso, stand and stuff. The Australian Bureau of Statistics will be giving all eligible Australians the opportunity to express their view on whether Australian marriage laws should be changed to allow same-sex couples to marry. Survey forms will be sent to all eligible Australians on the Commonwealth Electoral Roll. To participate, you must be enrolled. To enrol, check or update your details, visit the AEC website, search AEC or visit an AEC office. The roll will close Thursday, August 24 for this survey. Authorised by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Canberra. Spoken by Jake Downs. Matthew Evans returns with Gourmet Farmer Series 4, out now on DVD. You'd be able to look out and go, that's where the vegetables came from, that's where the pigs came from, that's where the milk came from. About as, as perfect as it can get off the tree. Matthew comes full circle from being an acclaimed food critic to building and running his own farm-to-table restaurant, Fat Pig Kitchen. Yeah, that's good. Gourmet Farmer Series 4, out now on DVD. Available on iTunes and at all good retailers. Unfortunately, a familiar scene. It's your world. The threat is constantly evolving. Be better informed. These sort of attacks are going to be with us for the rest of our lives. SBS World News, nightly at 6.30. Sharon, you're 52. Where are you living? I'm in, living in transitional housing right now. And what does that involve? How many people are you living with? I'm living with nine other women um, in a house and that's very different to where I've come from. Where have you come from? What sort of life did you have before? I've come from a corporate background, earning six figures, travelling the world for business, having a corporate credit card, having a gold access to the Qantas Club Lounge. That was my world. So how did your life change then so dramatically? My life changed a year ago. So prior to that, I'd taken a sabbatical and I went through the death of both my parents. Um, I was with both of them when they took their last breath and I'm an only child, so I have no family. So I was working abroad last year and um, something happened on the ship I was working on and I was sent home within 24 hours. So they flew me back here and that's what started my homeless journey a year ago. I was put into crisis accommodation. What was the job that you had on the ship? I was a port and shopping guide. So I got up and spoke about shopping in the ports of Gaul throughout the Caribbean to a thousand people. So you'd point. lost your job at I this lost point. my job, mm -hmm. yeah. Let's have a look at where you're living at the moment sure. in transitional housing. I live in a house that has 10 bedrooms. I have one of those bedrooms. It's quite large, it's my sanctuary. My whole world is in this room and probably under the bed as well. I know it's not great feng shui, but there's quite a bit under the bed too. <laughs> Majority of my clothing is from Dress for Success. Vinnie's have helped me, Cat's Closet down in Mullamaloo. I'm an avid reader, so lots of books. I haven't paid for any of the books. They've all been given to me. Mirror here. Got that on the street, just outside. Um, Neighbour was giving it away. You know, I have the same challenges every single day. The state of the bathroom when I wake up, or is my food gonna stay, still be on my shelf? You know, that's, that's normal in um, this type of living situation. But as you can hear, I've got my, my little birdies there that, you know, come and greet me every day. And they're like my family, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm very blessed to be living here. Now, you sound pretty cheerful about living in that transitional housing. Does that suit you at the moment? 
would I want to be there? No, of course not, Jenny. You know, I'm an only child. I've always lived on my own, so I would want to have my own accommodation. But right now, I'm making the best of the situation that I'm, I'm dealt. I started work last week, um, but prior to that, I have something called autosclerosis. Um, I'm lip reading, most people here this evening. So I have 20% um, hearing in my right ear and my left ear is pretty bad as well. So I've got a job, then after three months, I lose the job. I get a job, after three months, I lose the job. So nothing has been verbalised, whether it's about my hearing um, or whether I'm just not the right fit, um, but I seem to get over that probation period and I'm let, I've been let go. And given that you were earning the kind of money that you're talking about that you used to earn, I mean, what happened to all of that? So I took two years off. I paid, I paid for my sabbatical. Um, and I guess starting a job, losing a job, paying expensive rent in Melbourne, um, the money goes. I mean, I haven't tried to maintain this 100,000 or six-figure lifestyle while I haven't been working. You know, everything changes. You have to change. I did join Tony Robbins, which, you know, in hindsight, I still don't have any regrets about that. It was $65,000 to join it. $65,000. And you had that kind of money? Absolutely. Because you'd inherited it from your parents when you... I received some inheritance. I sold an apartment. Um, but in my mind, it was like, I'll get another job. I'll have that base salary of 80000 again. I'll have, you know, 70000 commission in a year. Why did you do that? Why did you spend $65,000 on a motivational speaker? One of the big reasons for me, Jenny, is not having a family. Um, not that Tony and Sage took the place of my family, but it felt like a community, a really strong, I guess, you know, we're known as family, you know, when you're a platinum partner, you, you know, travel with Tony and Sage throughout the world and everyone that's part of that is like family. They're like brothers and sisters. At your sort of peak financially, how much money did you have sitting behind you? I would say 370,000. And how long ago was that? That was in 2010. And where did all that money go apart from $65,000 to Tony Robbins? Oh, well, sorry, I should say, you spend $65,000 to become a platinum partner, but then you have to pay for the trips. <laughs> I know everyone's shaking their head in the audience. <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sort of lost for words, really. Um, what do you... What, uh, <laughs> What did you do that for? Well, I guess this was part of my sabbatical, so I wasn't thinking um, at all. You know, it was like I'd, I've never had maternity leave. I felt like this time was mine, you know, and I deserved it. So you took two years off? Absolutely, and I have no regrets about that whatsoever. I can't think backwards. I have to think forwards. I just can't. And, what, can't does say, for and what does forwards look like for you at the moment? I'm working right now. So for me, the future is a lot better than it was six months ago, than it was six weeks ago. Kath, you're 55 and until recently you were living in your car for how long? Uh, over two years, the last time. The last time, so yeah. you've done it before? Yes. OK, yeah, let's nice. have a look. I used to sort of sleep wherever I could. I used to go up and down this highway or this road so many times and days just looking for somewhere that I didn't camp the night before. So I don't know where I'm going to end up in a few weeks' time. I could very well end up back in here and travelling the road again. I used to make beautiful meals and these cost me between two and five dollars. Here I used to make veggies in a um, got foil. And it's come out like a roast. It's beautiful. People used to walk past and go, well, that smells really good. How are you doing that? When I was in some areas, I managed to find showers that had showers. Disabled toilets are usually the best because they've got like a bench and stuff where you can put, put your stuff. I didn't actually realise I was homeless for many years. I was like, until one of the social workers in a really good charity down the coast said to me, Kath, you're homeless. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not. <laughs> I'm sleeping in a car. She said, that's homeless. This is a reasonably safe area, I guess, as long as the councils don't come down. When I see the water I've got, 
a million dollars. But if I can see the water, it gives me some sort of hope. I never saw anyone here at night in any cemeteries I stayed in. To me, it was like, who's going to go to the cemetery at night? I'm not scared of cemeteries. Everyone's dead. Nothing to be scared of. It's out there that's scary with the live people. They're the ones that taunt you and scare you and haunt you. I always tried to stay very positive about it all, that something was going to work out and um, everything was going to be OK. So, yeah, I just move on and hope no one saw me. And if I felt like I, they were seeing me, I'd, I'd just move. Yeah. So it's just like being on the run, really. But you're on the run from nothing. You haven't done anything wrong. It's not, it's not a crime to be homeless, you know. But yet it is, because the council's fine you. <laughs> Kath, <laughs> where, where are you living now? Um, I'm in a unit for another four weeks, just a little studio apartment. It hasn't got a kitchen or anything like that. Um, so I've got another four weeks in that. Um, it's affordable, um, just, and I don't know where I'm going to be in four weeks' time because all the rents are quite unaffordable. So up in the air completely? Yeah. About where, what will you do? Don't know. Car. You've still got the car. Got yeah. car. And the car the becomes car. very important to cars, a lot of women my in this home. situation. Car's my home. When you're in the car, you've got no downfall. You know where you're at. It's when you're renting and when you're staying in places that you might have that downfall. What happened after you lived in your car for that two years? What happened to you? Um, I actually tried to ignore it, Jen. And I used to go and have my barbecues and sit on the river and go, oh, this is good. Other people are paying $1,000 a week to stay here and I'm just sitting here, you know, and enjoying it, pat dogs, you know, talk to people. No one knew, you know, and if they did, I'd move onto another area. As soon as you thought they knew that you yeah, were homeless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how did, how did it affect you living in your car? It, the worst thing was sleeping in it because I'm cramped and I couldn't actually stretch out. <clears throat> and I have a lot of injuries. But I actually just sort of went, look, just look at it like you're on holiday sort of thing, you know, and not think about it too hard. Meanwhile, I'd be looking for accommodation, um, share accommodation or house sitting. You know, whatever, I would have given my right arm to have a bus, you know, or a Toyota coaster or something, because at least you can sleep and cook and stuff in it. But sleeping just in a car is a whole different yeah. story. Mm, you yeah, know, it and is. plus it's very, very risky. You know, I was very lucky that my car could lock it at night and it had an alarm system. But I did have many times blokes walking around my car, you know, and I'd just get in it and take off, you know. And did it get to you? Did yeah, anything like that did. get to you? Yeah, eventually it did. Eventually I broke down. Um, I just wanted to... I just could not see any way out. I rang up my son and I said to him, I, I'm, I, I don't know what to do anymore. And I said, I feel like I'm just going to run my car into a tree. And he actually ran the police and the police went round for about eight hours looking for me. And uh, anyway, they took me to hospital. And the hospital um, let me stay there for a week until my next pay. How did you get to this situation? Um, I had injuries, basically. I, had, uh, I was hit, by, hit and run by a car. Um, that put me out of action for a few years. I went back to work, but I was working contract work, um, making good money, but I was, I was at the mines and sometimes I'd have three or four months between jobs. Eventually it ran out. And then through all the years of work, um, I, I had like about another eight operations on my arms and I could not work anymore. So, yeah, I just all fell to bits. And what do you think of the stories you're hearing here tonight? Um, they're interesting. Things like this are making the younger people realise that it can happen to them. You know, be careful. It, it can happen just like that. You know, a superannuation, another thing. I mean, I never really got superannuation until the mines, and that's not much. The little jobs I did before that, basically the super went on expenses, you know, where they take it back mm. sort on of thing. On the fees, yeah. yeah. So there's mm. nothing in it. Mm. I've got a little bit of super now and all I'm doing is hoping hell that the superannuation stays at a level that I can get to the stage where I can buy myself a camper van when I get it. But that's not for another three and a half years. What did you think you were going to live on when you got older? 
I thought the work would keep up. I didn't know that I'd, like I've just had another major accident, you know, that's put me basically out for a, for a while, my spinal damage and, and so forth. Sharon, what did you think you were going to live on when you got older? Uh, definitely not New Start, you know, or the pension or anything like that. I just um, thought I'd be married, we'd have, you know, a couple of properties and portfolio of shares, that sort of thing. That's, that's my re that would have been my reality. That was what you thought was going to happen? Absolutely. Mm. And what about super? Did you have super? I still have super. Mm. So have you, how much super do you have? Have you accessed that? I have 75,000. I've accessed 10,000 of it. Okay. And that was difficult to do. Christine, did you have super? No. Uh, bits and pieces, but because I was contracting, um, you'd, you'd have a few thousand in one super and a few thousand in another super. With increasing unemployment from 2000 onwards, you reach a point where you've got no money coming in and the car's got to be fixed. So you cash out a little super to fix the car. And when that goes on for 15 years, there's not much left. Di, what about you, super-wise? I did have a little bit of super. I think it was probably less than 20,000, probably 15, I, I can't remember. But I did access that, um, you know, when I left my husband. It was the, the only, only thing I had access to. Doris, what happened to your super? Well, in, in hairdressing, or in, uh, we were never taught to have super. So the government really made it official in the 90s. So did you have any? Well, um, I had a couple of years when I was in business with my brother. So, um, yeah, and at 60, you can take it out and not pay taxes. So I had 16,000 at that time. So I went around the world. You went around the world on yeah. your super? Yeah, 16,000. And what, what do you think about that decision now? I can't look at it that way. I had a wonderful time, yeah? It's once in your lifetime. In my lifetime, at least at 60 years old, the things that I've always dreamt to do, I did it. Um, 16,000 is neither here or there. Yeah, 16,000 is can't not going to save the day. Mm. So, you know, so let's do it. Yeah. You know, well and if I feel like I should have kept it, no. Especially knowing now where I am today, that 16,000 wasn't going to make no difference. Gwenda, you're 79 and you found yourself without anywhere to live at 78. Why? I was um, um, a living in housekeeper um, for many, many years uh, and also became their carer. Uh, the person got very ill and the person that owned the house <coughs> went to hospital at the beginning of the year and died. Um, and the family said, we want you out within two weeks. We're going to sell the house. How long had you been there? 26 years? Something like that. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I thought, what am I going to do? I had my name down for a two-bedroom government apartment, but that was going to come sometime in the future. I was in desperate state. I didn't know where I was going to go, what I was going to do. But I have a very fortunately <clears throat> got a beautiful granddaughter. And she said, Grandma, I'll help you. She got on the internet and found a program called One Link, where I'm living now in Chapman and Canberra. There was one room available in this magnificent big house. There's eight ladies all together. We all have our own bedroom and ensuite. We take our own furniture, knickknacks, uh, lounge rooms, dining rooms. And I was made very welcome. You ran this man's business for 26 years for well, him? Well, for many years. We lived there on the south coast. He had a taxi business. Um, he couldn't read and write and do the book work, so I ran that for him for a number of years. I wasn't really paid any wages as such, but I had a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. I paid for all my own uh, personal things like a car, telephone, all that sort of thing. What about thinking about your own financial circumstances? You're I obviously think... very good at running his, but what about your own situation? I just thought life would just go on. <laughs> Never thought about it. And I am 
absolutely so fortunate and it's thanks to my granddaughter and the lovely ladies in the house where I live. They have been so good to me. So um, you've really lucked out, Gwenda, with your housing situation. I just could not have done any better and I'm there till they carry me out in my beautiful pink coffin. <laughs> good on you. <laughs> Did you... Did you at any stage when you were living in that house with, with that man and helping him with his business at, as his carer, did you at any stage think about what would happen if he died? Well, to be honest, quite no, I don't. I just went with the flow. I thought tomorrow's another day and I just did never think. There is a theme emerging here, ladies, I have to say, in, in terms of everybody thinking, what, that things were just going to be fine everything, yep. everything will be all right is that is that what happens is that what I don't think what that's, people think no I don't think that's it at all I think it's that if you do think it through and think it through thoroughly you know there is no way out um, and so you go day by day because you know you can never earn enough after a certain age you can never earn enough to buy your way out of this trouble and so all you can do is live day by day and hope a, a miracle happens. Mm. But I suppose the question I'm asking is what about thinking about it a lot earlier? Like, mm. you know, when you're 30 How and when you're 25. How many people these days think about it? Both? Sorry? Yeah. I, I mean, I just want yeah. to throw that out yeah. there. I, I want a reaction from some of the younger women here. <laughs> yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to just <laughs> ask how you feel about what you're hearing and what you think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am 30. I've been working full time for the last seven, eight years, and I don't plan for, fi for my financial future. Um, I do rely on my super, if I was to think about it, but I think more in six months ahead, in a year ahead, I'm more focused on my career. Mm. Who does have a plan, or, or feels like they have a plan? Gina? Um, I have a super, and I have an investment property, and I think because our generation is growing up in an area where we, we know housing affordability is really hard. We have to have a plan. And I started thinking about that now when I was 30. So I think, I think women should really get on board the knowing what you need to do yeah. for the rest of your life because I think it's important. Yes. I'm in my 30s. I don't know anybody that's got their own apartment in my age bracket that didn't get help from their parents. Mm. So it's like even if you do all the right things and put you know, self, other people's perceived bad decisions you made aside, someone could do everything right, go to uni, yeah. keep working as hard as they can, get made redundant in the same month, the CARG, whatever. There's a whole bunch of things and not ever make enough to, to get a foot in our property market. You know, like it, it's, it's, it's difficult even doing everything right. Kath, you mentioned your adult son before. Would you consider living with him? I wouldn't do it to him. He's got a girlfriend. He lives in a one-bedroom unit. What am I going to do, go and sleep on his couch? Mm. Not an option at all? No, I wouldn't ruin his life. That'd be terrible. Di, what about you, living with kids? Would you consider that? Oh, I, I have. Um, I mean, at the moment, um, I've, I've been living with my daughter with the van in the in their yard. Um, but I, it, it, it's not easy um, doing it, and I don't want to impose uh, on my daughter. I mean, she does talk about a granny flat. We've, we've talked about all sorts of options, but I don't want that either because well, I think one of, the, it, one of the big issues with senior um, you know, women is the loneliness. And my, my family are too busy. You know, they, they work, the, their children play sport, seven days a week, I think. Um, I, I'd be sitting in a, um, a granny flat all on my own, isolated again. Doris, I'm interested in your response to that because you are living with yes, your daughter. I, I live with my daughter and I also live with my son. I have two grandchildren. They keep me alive. They are the most important things on this earth for me at the moment and they make me happy. And it's youth and I understand I am taking that space. I don't like taking that space yeah. in their home. OK, can I get some reactions over here? There's some murmuring over here. Ladies here, what do you think? I, I think it depends. Like, in our culture, um, they're happy to 
to get their family, like for example, like me, um, they'll be happy to take me with them. And it's not for them that I'm getting a space or anything. Mm. Yeah, you, very different. So, so different cultural responses exactly. to that situation. That's yeah. right. Anyone else? Yes, Lucretia? You're not never an imposition. No. Ever. No. Ever. Think it's just different cultures mm. in heaps of places all around the world. The elderly are revered and mm. you'd really want them around. He's for them on childcare. Everything. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the <laughs> selfish way. You want them on childcare. Built in built in cleaner. And, and <laughs> that. Cook. No, but I was yeah. actually talking about the whole the yeah. value you have. Mm. Like yeah. what you have you know, to offer is everything, you know. Yeah. Because of my mum, I lived with my mum for all those years. And I think I never thought I would ever part from there. And you know, my daughter and my son feel it's not even a question. Mum, you don't even have to ask us. This is it. Not a couch, a bedroom. Yeah. yeah? So it's, it's hard for me mm. as a yeah. mother. And, and they all know I, to come to this. Um, mm. It's a hard place. Yeah. Only then will I accept the emergency housing that they will offer. Because once I'm in there, I'm dead. So do you have an actual plan beyond the van? No. I'm certainly not giving up at this point. Good evening. Insight returns in a moment. But first, the stories making headlines. Afghanistan expresses gratitude for President Trump's commitment to a continued military presence. Two people are dead and 40 injured after a powerful quake rocked Italy's southern coast. And the government strips the second Melbourne Council of its right to hold citizenship ceremonies. We'll have a full bulletin at 10 o'clock. On Dateline, SBS's Sarah Arbo and the heartbreak inside Lebanon's refugee camps. Syrians, young and old, are dying from treatable and preventable diseases. Dateline, next on SBS. Mike Christiva. He's heading up a task force. Targeting our firm. Hi. Jack, please. You go after me professionally, I'll go after you personally. We're just getting started. The Good Fight, tomorrow 9.30 on SBS and On Demand. The Australian Bureau of Statistics will be giving all eligible Australians the opportunity to express their view on whether Australian marriage laws should be changed to allow same-sex couples to marry. Survey forms will be sent to all eligible Australians on the Commonwealth Electoral Roll. To participate, you must be enrolled. To enrol, check or update your details, visit the AEC website, search AEC or visit an AEC office. The roll will close Thursday, August 24 for this survey. Authorised by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Canberra. Spoken by Jake Downs. Being a kid is about dreaming big, which is why MTA goes the extra mile to find and create world-leading teaching resources that inspire classrooms and help educators and parents go the extra mile to unlock the potential of little dreamers everywhere. The Lexus LC500 is clearly a beast. One touch of the start button and a symphony begins. Part Beethoven, part Hendrix. It's an adrenaline rush watching the rest of life trying to keep up in the rearview mirror. I think I'll take the scenic route back. At Best and Less, our kids' soft organic cotton tees are guaranteed to last, guaranteed not to lose their colour, and guaranteed to keep their shape. Now for the new everyday low price of just $3. That's why we're called Best and Less. MDT is in all kinds of neighbourhoods, and it's more prevalent than ever. This is an ET, a mobile drug test. The next police car you see could be a mobile drug testing unit. MDT, there's no escaping it. 
We're told that endless economic growth is the solution to all our problems. But what if growth is the problem? Our growth-addicted economic system will see our children living in a world of 11 billion people, more than our finite planet can withstand. It's a path to more inequality, famine, disaster, war, collapse. Are we that stupid? It's time to choose a new path without the insanity of endless growth. Google Dick Smith, fair go. Authorised by Dick Smith, Terry Hills. In an Australian first. How are you? An obesity clinic with a new perspective. It's not your fault. That's what I've been wanting to hear for so long. The Obesity Myth starts Monday 4th of September on SBS and On Demand. Kath, what's going to happen? For you next, I do you think? Know. It's a hard place. You don't know. I don't know. So you don't know where you're going to be living in a few weeks' time. No, I'm looking. Have I'm you put hoping. your name down for public housing? No, because it's going to take me at least eight to ten years, and I wouldn't live in half of them. Why wouldn't you live in half of them? Because I don't like them. They're terrible. They're boxes, yeah. and they're in environments that I wouldn't live. I'd rather be in my car. Personally, I'd feel safer. Christine. Have you applied for public housing? Where are you up to with that? Um, yeah, this is where I started, where I want to imagine that I've still got choices. Um, I was told how to get myself from the general waiting list into, onto the emergency list, which would see me very quickly into housing. But then I have to take the first place that yes. I'm offered. Mm. And it doesn't matter if it's on a major ro road, um, it doesn't matter if it's in a dangerous area or noise pollution or whatever, you have to take it or you're back down. But I'm trying to do something better than that because I think there are better options. Mm. Um, and what are those better options? Uh, personally, for me, I want to... And, and I'm working towards trying to get involved with um, ECHO community housing. Uh, we don't need $300,000 houses. Mm. We can build a prefab for $30,000, $40,000 mm. um, if the land is made available. So all it takes is a bit of government land. So there's, there's viable alternatives, and this is where I say I live in fantasy land, because I will continue to try and work towards those alternatives. And it won't be until I find myself in hospital, because I've finally worn out, and refuse to leave because I've got nowhere left to go, only then will I accept the emergency housing that they will offer. Because if once I'm in there, I'm dead. And I know that. It, it's, it's not the kind of life I can live. Di, what happens if you get sick living in your van or...? I, I don't know. It is a question that, that um, I don't have the answer for. It's certainly something that I've thought about. Um, and what happens when you're older or if you can't drive or...? Absolutely. Well, I don't need to drive. I can just park it somewhere. <laughs> How would but... you like to live in the future? <laughs> uh, look, I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to have a small unit. It doesn't have to be big and, you know, somewhere comfortable that I can know that I can stay there for the rest of my life until I got too sick to, you know before they put me in a nursing home or something. But, um, no, I, I, I would like safe, affordable, simple housing. So do you have an actual plan beyond the van? No. Um, well, yes and no, but it's a bit Dreamsville. But I am working towards something. I'm certainly not giving up at this point, not giving up. And I know the van's not long-term for me. Gwenda, how, how long can you live where you are? I'm there till the end of my days. There's no time limit whatsoever. Mm. And shared housing really suits you? Well, the nicest thing, if I'd lived in a two-bedroom government apartment by myself, I wouldn't know anybody. But where I am now, I've got seven other friends. If I want company, we sometimes have meals together, we go out mm. together. If you want to be by yourself, you can be by yourself. Mm. And it... It was an absolute blessing that my granddaughter found this for me because I had nowhere to go. If you had your time over again, would you do anything differently? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What would you do differently, Di? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. 
Yes, I'd, um, I'd, I'd certainly be more, more organised with, with the finances. And I, I was pretty well, but I, it, it was challenging in a, in a, a marriage. I, I don't know whether I'd get married. But then at the same time, I have uh, uh, lovely children, two, two beautiful children and four beautiful grandchildren that wouldn't have happened unless I went down that, that route. Would you do anything differently, Doris, if you had your time over? No. The only thing I would... I would have been a bit more um, careful. I wouldn't have trusted so much. In my journey, my life has been exactly what I wanted, whether it was the family, whether it was the business, and the grandchildren, and my mum, yeah? And my mum was the key of it all, yeah? But I wouldn't change it. The only thing that... Um, <sighs> Yeah, I would have had super when I was 30. Mm. That would be the only thing I would have done. Christine, would you have done anything different? into a different body. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not going to be ashamed of myself for being in my current situation. Uh, because for anyone to have lived that long with fibromyalgia and still be functioning, I've done extremely well. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing else I could have done. OK, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Very generous of you to share your story. It's been a really interesting conversation. And that is all we have time for here, but let's keep talking on Twitter and on Facebook. How would you describe your reading and your writing? Very poor. Well, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It's been a nightmare. I couldn't even basically read any words at all. They called me dumb so many times that you actually start to think you are dumb. That shame belongs to us that can read and write, not the people that have low literacy. We'll be back next week.